Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an plus alcoholic, as it describes in this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I've recovered today from the hopeless state of mind and body. My home group is the Jay Walker's Big Book Study Group on a Sunday night, and we work through the 164 pages in, in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, what I've used to recover that. I love the... Uh, I love the name of this meeting, Clear Cut Directions. You know, because it's always been hammered into me. Clear Cut Directions. <clears throat> you know, for years I used to think that I was a, you know, um, a hardened drinker. You know, that, that is the delusion that I lived in. I was a hardened drinker. I live in a family full of hardened drinkers and hardened drug takers. They can stop and moderate and, and put it down and you know, change the warning of a doctor or get married. My dad will like that. I'm a hardened drug taker. You know, I can stop and moderate at the warning of a doctor and stuff, you know. It's a yet for me, yeah. Drugs. Alcohol. I have no control whatsoever around alcohol. And I'm under no delusion today, you know, that alcohol has more power over me than anything. Well, the thing is that I found a power in my life today that doesn't render me powerless anymore. You know, and that's that's my experience. What I'm going to share tonight is my experience of, of you know, being around and, you know, I serve, sobered up on the 30th of March 2010. And, and I'm not going to say, you know, my recovery has been happy, joyous, and free. But it's been a damn sight easier than smashing myself to bits for 28 years like I did and not knowing what I lived with. You know, because it talks about how terrifying this illness can be. You know, not only terrifying for me, but terrifying for the people that are around me. You know, I, I love... I love them explanations in the big book of, you know, smashing myself on the head with an hammer. You know, I just can't feel a pain. Or, you know, like I'm like that guy that likes to put my hand on the, the hot stove. You know, why do I keep getting burnt again? You know, I could not, and I, I love that reading, I could not bring into sufficient force, you know, that, that suffering or humiliation. You know, but I'd swear off I'm not going to do it again. You know, every relationship that I ever got into, well, every hostage I ever took, I swear I wouldn't do it again. I mean it. I'd swear it to the, all the people that employed me. I'll be at work on a Monday, you know, and all the times that they were disappointed when they had to say, listen, well, I've just got to let you go. You know, for me, I, I never, I never thought when I took that first drink at eight year old that I love what it says. I love the effect produced by alcohol, and it says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that men and women like the effect produced by alcohol, not alcoholics and addicts, men and women. So for me, you know that when I took that first drink. You know, I, I I can remember it to this day, me and my little sister. My little sister never copped this. She's a hardened drug taker, and I could... I always used to scratch my head. I mean, she took things further than I ever took. She injected heroin and crack cocaine, and then she detoxed at my friends, and that were it. She had a family and, and, and turned her life around again, and, and, and you know, like, and she always used to say this to me. You're a bit different to me, our kid. Some of the just don't click right with you. I love what it says about, you know, because I do a lot of stuff around emotional sobriety today. You know, and this is it. I sit in a steel-on-steel -steel group once a month with three other fellows, you know, and 
and we sharpen each other's spiritual, you know, life. We get honest with each other, and I need that. You know, as an eight-year-old boy, you know, I spent 23 years, and I love what it says about mental health, I spent 23 years in mental health. Doctors, psychiatrists, mental health institutions, you know, and, and it'd always be that thing, you know, that I'm just going in here, I just need a break. I'd be separated from the alcohol. My mind would start to start to sort itself out again and then as soon as that door were open I think you know like maybe I've cracked it this time <laughs> painless count painless I love what it says you know in this book I had so many so many painless attempts at trying to keep myself sober through human power. I can't even remember. You know, I used to kick the psychiatrist's door because he used to tell me I had to stop drinking and, and, and taking recreational drugs before he could do anything for me. And I kicked the door and say, well, I'm here because that's what you've got to do for me. Because I was so baffled why I could not be separated from this. Because... I'm asleep to my problem. You know, I, I don't, I don't realise that. You know, I'm walking into losing all control. You know, that's my that that's my step. I love what it says in more about alcoholism. In, fact, in that first page, five times it mentions a, a lack of control. You know, and that's what builds up for me that lack of control, and and you know, I have this insidious idea that you know, like maybe I am going to, you know, get better every time I go in these psychiatric units because I've never done detox and I've never done rehab, but I've done psychiatric u units, you know, and you're talking to someone that wasn't allowed in any licensed premises in the whole of the United Kingdom at 19 year old and still couldn't get round, still couldn't get into my mind that maybe I've got a problem with alcohol. Even the Crown Court judge knew that I had a problem with alcohol. That's why he did some frothy emotional appeal on me and said, I'll send you to jail, there, there. Maybe you might be able to sort yourself out, Mr Fox. I'll tell you what I did when I went straight to prison. I found a way of brewing alcohol. <laughs> And I don't think I, I don't think I had a sober day while I was in there. Once that, once I could get what I needed, you know. And that's that thing, and it, and it's kind of like, and I hear people say that they, they really, they really never ever fitted in, you know. Like I did fit in, like that social chameleon, you know. Like, what well, talks about these character defects, selfish and self-centered the root of our problems. I was so selfish and self-centered to the core that I would slip in and get what I needed. I love it when people say, well, I used to isolate on myself. This is my, my experiences. I used to isolate because I like drinking on my own, so you can't, have any, you can't have anything of what I've got. And then I'll come and find all you guys and I'll drink what you've got and I'll use what you've got. You know, that, that was me. You know, the isolation for me was inside. That's where it came, that spiritual malady. You know, I, I, I love the explanation of the phenomenon of craving, and, and I like it like this. It's a thirst that only God can quench for me today. Because once I put that first drink in, you know, I, I've had a glass of water there. Of a, I can have a glass of Coke. And I get my thirst is quenched once I put any alcohol in there. That phenomenon of craving is just unbelievable. You know, and, uh, and I always kind of I really get with the obsession of the mind that somehow, someday I will control my drinking. You know, I don't know how many times that I've been around that, that thinking that delusion, 
I'm in a psychiatric hospital. I've been freed from alcohol again, and I'm I'm seven months sober. That insidious idea comes, you know, like that mental blank spot that he talks about in more about alcoholism, and I'm, and I'm off. I think that's a good idea. I pick up that first drink. I love what he says about Jim. Suddenly, you know, he loses his in, insanity. And then in, the sanity returns a little bit. Vaguely, I sensed I was being too smart. A little bit of that sanity comes back, but it's gone because the idea won out. You know, about that first drink, love it. You know, and I've got experience and stuff around that, you know. <clears throat> when I fully conceded to my innermost self, and I love that, fully conceded to my innermost self, no one else, me. Once that once that had once that had been cemented in there that you know I'm beaten. I love what it says, alcohol is a great persuader. You know. How delusional my thinking is when I think that I've got more power than alcohol, and alcohol, alcohol's got more power than me. You know, it's experience of 28 years of my life shows it. Failed relationships, failed career, prison, broken friendships. You know, and I love what it says, you know, like it says about willpower as well, you know what? I, I can muster up willpower, but it is going to give way at some point. You know, it will give way at some point. You know, so what I really need to get into me is that, you know, I suffer from a phenomenon of craving and an obsession of the mind. You know, and that I have to fully concede to my innermost self that, you know what, He's got me. I'm beaten. You know, that is my step one. Dr. Silkworth even talks about it in, in the doctor's opinion of how hopeless he feels trying to help alcoholics and addicts of our type. You know, Dr. Young is exactly the same as well with Roland Hazard. This is the thing. So when I get to that that point where, you know, I admit my powerlessness and I know that I'm not going to drink again, I need to find a power. But me saying that, I'm not going to drink again because I'll tell you something and I'm going to be honest with you, I do really not know when that day is going to happen again. Because I need to be in fit spiritual condition because that's what it tells me. I plug into a power. It tells us we have to be willing. We have to be willing. You know, whatever that power is, and, uh, and agnostics gives us a lot of terms what we can plug into. Spirit of the universe. Remember someone saying to me, he says, I can't get this power. I said, just look outside of that window. That's more powerful than you. And he goes, I've got it, man. You know, and it's there, and I need to plug into that power because what have I been for 28 years of my life? I'm slowly becoming a dead battery, and I need to be recharged, and I need some power. That's it. That's it for me, and it, boom. You know, when I first started all this stuff all them years ago, and I did some work, five and a half thousand miles away from home in India, you know, I met a man armed with the facts about himself. And he could see 18 months in that I'm probably going to drink again or I'm going to, I'm, uh, you know, because one of my biggest character defects is anger, you know, and defensiveness and stuff like that. And he could see it and it came out one day and he says to me, he said, John, do you know what? Can I either find somewhere else to stay or I'll take you through the work? And he did do. And I remember going through this big book at first and it were all goggled a gook and you know, I'm putting it together, but I had an experience. And that's what he taught me. I had an experience. And, and you know, and, and that's it. You know, he cemented that step one straight into me. You know, for me, I need to, you know, it's like, 
you sit in the room and you hear the word about God, God, and I see newcomers come in and you know they wonder what it they wonder what it is. We have a lot of newcomers that come to our meeting on a Sunday night and we might be in a chapter, you know, where it references God quite a lot. You know, and, I, and there's a guy on this, there's a guy on this meeting tonight, you know, and we've got football together and stuff. And he said to me, he says, you know, what is your power, John? And I said, you know what? I don't even try to work out what it is today. Because I've been halfway through my recovery and I've dissected it and everything like that. And I'll tell you some of I've, I've got iller and iller and iller and iller. Because I start to put that spiritual toolkit down. Honestly, I'd have rather drunk than go through what I went through when I start to unravel where a nice place. So for me, you know, God of my understanding, you know, a willingness, a willingness to hand that 28. I ain't, I ain't had a good time in 28 years. I've made a hash of things, man. So am I going to be willing to hand that over to a power? Got to be. The willingness is there. I love the step free prayer. The step free prayer says to me that it's going to give me the strength to help someone else, someone that might be in this room tonight. I'm not a fellowship dismissive neither because when I turn up at other fellowships, there might be someone in that room that I've been sent to help. I used to be a fel- I used to be a fellowship dismissive, you know. But I- I- I'll be honest with you, quite a few of them fellowships have helped me along my way you know and, and our primary purpose is the same is to help the still suffering addicts alcoholic so when I find that willingness in step three to have my life over the care of God as I understand him as I understand him not how you lot understand him as I understand him you know then I'm on my way it tells us in step four that we need to be fearless. You know, because I'm going to have a look at some truth about myself, and I love step four because, you know, this is where I'm really going to find, you know, my causes and conditions, what's been driving me, because it tells us in step three as well. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of our cause. You know, and, and that's the thing, and I wouldn't do anything for anyone, but once I plugged into that power, You know, I, I do a job outside of this and everyone says, oh, you do really good and stuff like that. I separate my work life to my to my fellowship life. I don't separate the principles that I take into my work life, but I separate, I get a, I get a, a salary for what I do. You know, I can't, I have to, I have to pull it apart because I'll start getting confused with the work that I do one-on-to-one work, like it's directed in this book, you owe me, you owe me nothing. I've just got a sincere desire to be helpful. No, no axes to grind. No lectures to be endured. I ain't here to go, but I'm here to give you a bit of direction when you're losing a bit of direction. And that direction for me comes through God. So my step four, you know, and I've done five step fours because I, I resubmit to this work quite a lot. And my step fours get condensed and condensed. And, you know, and, and, and the last time I did a step four, I was lucky to do multiple fifth steps. I shared it with a priest. I shared it with a female. And I shared it with my sponsor who came up, sat in this room. This room looks big, but it's not. He's about six foot six as well, and he was knocking everything over. You know, and we went through it and, you know, and this is a person that's, te- I was 10 years in then and, I, and and I'm think I'm in fit spiritual condition, you know, and we've done this inventory and there's 17 names on there and I'm far from it. I remember the female who I shared it with said, fuck me, John, you need to find some humility. She said, this is a really good inventory because I want to find some truth about myself. You know, who do I think I am? You know, things came out in them character defects, Mr. Big Book, and they're dismissive. You know, all them kind of little things. You know, but I'll tell you that I'm spiritual. 
This is why I resubmit to the work. You know, my biggest amend, and I, I'll always go back to this with my first ever amend. You know, I've, I've attacked my mother physically, financially, that's mentally. You know, I held her hostage. I always pointed the finger at her and said, you've done this to me. You've made me the way that... You... My mum's a hardened drinker. She looks like an alcoholic. She drinks like an alcoholic, but she can stop. Came back from India, 2012. Sat with her for two and a half hours and, and made, you know, a heartfelt amend to her. And she told me a little bit about herself and why she treated me like she treated me. You know, and we, and we laid some things to bed and, you know, like, a, and I always say this, I always said to her, if there's anything that I can do, you know, ever, Mum, to put this right, just let me know. You know, she wanted me to walk to end at, end at Worlds for her, I would do. You know, as long as I could put that right, and that's the thing, in it, I got, I, you know, and, and we've not had a wrong word, a wrong word since that day with her. I've never rose my voice to her. You know, she don't. She gets her head down on the pillar on the night, and, and I've done this with my family as well. All my family, I've caused harm. I didn't even want my little brother to be born. You know, I had deep set resentment against my little bro. You know, because we had we, we had to bring him up. Do you know what? He's a fine man today. He's got two little girls and a bro, and a, and a boy, and you know what? And they and and they're all proud. Because they've seen the carnage that I left behind. But they've seen the man that I've come become today as a result of, you know, following some clear-cut directions within this book. Six and seven for me. You know, I have to ask God to remove these character defects and, you know, and, and, and they're there and we work with them. Yeah. It tells us, doesn't it, you know, a psychic change. I need to change my old ideas. I need to get a new set of thinking. Dr. Siltworth talks about it. Start to think differently. Start to change. You know, I've had many a list that I've had to go and sort out in step nine. People have told me to go and... You know, and I've been, like it says, I've withdrawn... Because if I don't, there might be an opportunity that one day that I might be able to put that right. And that's happened. People really need to know through the action. They see the action. This is what I love about the 12 steps. The 12 steps aren't just about reading it. It's about living it. It's about integrity. Principle five, walking the talk and talking the talk. I just don't sit here now. If any, If you were down in my fellowship that anyone, I don't sit here. And because I've been one of them people expect you to do what I'm not doing. Or I sit in a meeting and I big myself up what I am doing and this and that and that and that. I've just told you I unraveled. I'm never, ever going to go back to that place again. And I unraveled because I was telling you what you should be doing and I weren't doing it. It's not a nice place to be. You know, step 10s are really... It's, you know, for me, it's kind of, people get mixed up with 10 and 11. You know, and I, and I love step 10 because it tells me to watch, ask and turn. You know, it says we continue to take personal inventory when we were wrong and promptly admitted it. So four to nine. You know, if something's really, really bugging me and it ain't going away, I'm going to do some four to nine. But as I go through the day, it asks me to watch, ask, and turn. On the spot, inventory, straight away. It's like a mantra that, I, that I've learned, watch, ask, and turn. How can I turn my thoughts to someone else? Bill W talks about it so much in this book. In 88 pages, I think he approximately mentions it about 120 times, constant thought of working with others will always get me out of a spot. 
doesn't tell us about that we're ever going to stop thinking about self as well. Tells us that when we're slipping into that stuff, we, we should have constant thought for what we can do for someone else. It's flipping it around, isn't it? Selfishness and self-centeredness. You know, I do the 12 prayers and 12 meditations. You know, we're big on that down in West Sharps. You know, we start on page 83 and we're finishing a vision for you. And there's 12 prayers within that and some vision work in the morning. What's it look like when I'm selfish? What's it look like when I'm dishonest? What's it look like when I'm kind, I'm considerate, I'm tolerant, I'm patient? You know, I remember that used to be a big ask when I first ever started doing it. But, you know, it's like anything, practice, practice, because 10 and, 10 and 11 for me is about practice. You know, I sit and I do my review in the morning, not on an evening. But remember, this is my experience, because when I get up in the morning, I'm clear-headed. When I go to bed on a night, because I do work with people, you know, I'm tired. Do have some quiet time before I settle down. And then it tells me, done it in step 12, the bright spot of my life is being able to work with others. And you know what? That's constantly what I've done for the past 10 years. Even when I unraveled, I, I still worked with others. You know, and I, and, and, I, and I do, and I work with alcoholics and addicts. If your dog came up and asked me if it were an addict, I would work with your dog. That's it. That's the honest truth. And you know what? And I try to be as helpful as I can. I think the main part of this kind of stuff is that, you know, I, I you know, I live with someone. I live with, you know, I brought... A boy up from since he was 10 year old is not mine, you know what what a great guy he is. You know, I dote on him. He's 18 year old. You know what? He's never seen me drink. Sees all my friends in fellowship and stuff like that, because we've got football together and stuff. And my my missus has never seen me drink. Her dad died of of this illness. You know, but my family life, you know, if you came to my house, you know, this is where this is what we talk about in it to the wives and the family afterwards. You know, is there peace and serenity within my house? Is there trust? Is there love? Of course there is. We've never had an argument in eight years of being together. And she's not one of us. And I love it because I'll have people right at the house as well, you know, and they'll be sat on couch and stuff like that and we'll be doing work and stuff. And, and she's, she was the first person when I bent over the bed and said, Seven years in, I don't think I need to do this stuff anymore. I think I've cracked it. And she looked at me like insanity, insanity had returned. And she said to me, please, John, will you phone your sponsor? Because I was in a state, absolute state. You know, that, that, you know, that this, this is, this is the thing in it. This is the kind of woman she is that I'm going to Thailand for a month. Yeah, in in November for a month on my own. You know, that's what God's given me today, trust. You know, because I love what it says in step four, because I've built ideals. And I, and I try and mould myself to them ideals. That's the thing. Friendships, future sex conduct, family life. I try and give away what I've been given. There's no conditions. I were never given any conditions. Except that I pass it on to the next person. You know, and anyone that I work with, I always say, you know, like, it's imperative that you work with others like I've worked with you. And I've watched a fellowship in West Yorkshire grow around a few of us doing what he talks about in Step 12 and flourishing. I've seen it. It's powerful. I hope you've got something out of what I've shared tonight. Um, 
You know, it's it, it, it's it, I'm I'm full of gratitude, and if there's any newcomers within this meeting, please latch on to someone that's armed with the facts, and, and you know, like you will live a life like I live today, and that's free with peace of mind. Thank you, and thank you for letting me be a service. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.